Hey everyone, Cynix here. I have seen your requests and it is finally time to do an anatomy quick tips on eyes. I shall do my best to impart all of my ocular wisdom upon you. There's certainly a lot to get through, but if you're a good pupil, you'll be drawing wonderful eyes from imagination in no time. All right, let's talk about structure. I'm going to draw a very basic eye here so we can quickly go over the anatomy and the terms I'll be using. The colors are just to make things more obvious. Okay, that round black spot in the middle is of course the pupil. It gets bigger in low light and smaller in strong light, which I keep forgetting to actually implement in my paintings. Anyway, we have the eyelashes, which we'll talk about later, and the eye socket, which is colored in with purple. The upper lid is probably the most transformative part of this whole structure. The iris is the sometimes colorful larger circle around the pupil. And while it would be difficult to forget the eyeball itself, one part that occasionally gets overlooked is the lacrimal caruncle, which is that main visible part of tissue located on the lower inner side of the eye. It also has the tear duct around it and some other anatomy bits, but we'll just refer to this as the lacrimal area. I'm trying to limit the amount of times I say caruncle in one lifetime. The last part is of course the bottom lid. Not quite as fancy as the upper, but it'll do. All right, taking a quick break from structure, let's just go over one potential method for drawing and painting eyes. Eye lumps, my friends. This is where knowing the skull is going to become extremely helpful, so if you want to be amazing at drawing faces, I strongly recommend just doing skull studies until you can draw them reasonably well from imagination. In order to always have eyes that feel functional and proportional, you should visualize the eye socket first. You don't need to draw it, visualizing is enough for most cases. I do, however, enjoy drawing the eye lump, which is just the shape to represent both the eyeball and the lids around it. And you're probably thinking, why not just use a circle to represent an eyeball? Well, because circles ruin our organic flow, and rounded diamonds provide stronger reference points to anchor your details on. It's a tip that works for me, so hopefully it works for you. Anyway, that eye lump sits inside the eye socket, and you should always take angle into account when drawing it. With a good lump established, you can just carve out the actual eyelids and leave a nice simple opening in the middle. Or leave it closed. The eye lump is versatile. Traveling back to structure, it's extremely important to remember that because of the structure of the entire face, the inner side of the eye sits much deeper in the forms. Since we know the importance of drawing like a painter, drawing an area with deeper forms means less lighting, and less lighting equals more lines, or darker shapes. If I draw a boring, symmetrical-looking eye, we can even establish which side of the face it is on by simply adding some lines and depth on one side. I always love doodling simplified faces and simply implying the eyes with the deep shadows on the insides of the eyes. You can see how weird it would look if you made the outer sides deeper. It looks like a mouth or something. Anyway, try thinking in heavier, simplified shapes and play around with drawing faces using them. The priority of the things you show should always be based upon the strength of the plane shifts involved. Let's move on to some side notes. If you're drawing a face from the side, you can always remember that the lines around the eye should sink inward from the eye socket and then turn back outward once they hit the eyelids. Theoretically, you can also try to remember that the eyeballs aren't perfectly round. The cornea in front of the iris will protrude forward slightly. This can affect eyelid shape and whatnot, but honestly, you're probably not going to need to worry about this much. And if you are worried about it, then you're probably not watching YouTube art tips anyway. Oh well. Anyway, along the front of the eye socket, that top line can flow into the start of the eyebrow, and that bottom line can actually lead toward the side of the nostril. And don't forget, the upper lid is the main factor in closing your eyes. It's even more relevant when drawing from the side. Actually, you know what might really help your side views? Some nice eyelashes. The symbolic representation of eyelashes is usually just a bunch of long lines going both up and down from the eye. Kind of looks like a bug. This is not overly aesthetic or accurate, so instead let's try to focus on how the lashes actually work. If you look at an eye from the side, you can see that the top lashes tend to round down and then forward from the upper eyelid. The bottom lashes are less strong and usually just go at a downward angle away from the eye. Now it's time for the most important note about eyelashes. The eye is a three-dimensional form, and if a thin line is coming directly toward you, you're definitely not going to notice it much. 
especially compared to seeing it from the side. Just use this single blue eyelash as an example. If you're viewing an eye from the front, you'll probably only notice the eyelashes closer to the side of the eye as they're traveling sideways a bit. And of course, if you're viewing an eye from more of a three-fourths or side view, you'll probably only notice the eyelashes coming from the front of the eye. Okay, enough of these basics, let's talk about some common racial variations. I only say common because none of these things are universal, but this should still help you out. I feel that one of the main differences between Eastern and Western eyes is that Western eyes tend to be much more sunken into the eye socket, whereas many Asian ethnicities have eyes that are much less sunken into the skull. This might simply be a result of the stronger brow ridge and higher nose of many Western races, but whatever the reason, this is the overall effect. The results are that the Western eyes tend to have much more folds and looser skin around the eye, resulting in that rounder look and the eastern eyes tend to look more angular and simplified in their plane changes. I also feel like the eyelid skin is thicker, but maybe I just personally have thin-skinned eyelids. I can practically see with my eyes closed. Some quick added notes about these differences. The bottom lid on the western side usually sinks fast and doesn't take up much space, sometimes transitioning into the shape of the eye socket and forming some hefty eye bags. On our eastern example, the bottom lid actually protrudes from the facial planes along with the eye, creating a puffier and thicker looking bottom lid. It certainly helps with the aging process. Moving along to the upper lid, the looser western eye tends to create a stronger fold which certainly assists greatly in creating that rounder shaped eye. The eastern side becomes much more distinctive as the upper lid smoothly swoops around the entire eye and even overlaps with that inner lacrimal area in a form we call the epicanthic fold. Supposedly, this epicanthic fold is caused by having a much lower nose bridge, so keep that in mind when designing characters. Even babies tend to have this fold before the nose fully develops. Whew, we're covering so much stuff today. When it comes to the angle of the eye, it's not overly exclusive to any race. It seems most people can have a variety of subtle differences in the lateral angle of the eye, possibly just relating to individual skull and skin traits. However, this can be useful in character designing because more flatly angled eyes are often used to represent more innocence and naivety, while sharper angles in the skull and eye structures can often feel more aggressive. Just experiment around and see what works best for you. I will just briefly mention reductions. Once again, reductions are always based on lighting. A good simplification of a form comes from implementing shapes based on lighting schemes and avoiding iconography. The next step to simplifying eyes is to make sure you use minimal angular lines. You might use two or three lines for the top eyelid and another two for the bottom lid. Just avoid those evil lifeless circles. And of course, normal organic drawing rules still apply. Offset your angles and use lots of T-lines. A couple quick examples here of how to reduce an eye into its most basic shapes. From almost all normal lighting scenarios, you will quickly be losing that bottom eyelid and relying on subtle implications of forms. Also, eventually losing importance on the outer planes of the eye socket in favor of just the inner side. I think that's about it. Relationships of the eyes to other features were heavily covered in my nose anatomy video, so go watch it, but to further add to it, the eyes should be roughly halfway down the head. You can position them with about one eye length in between them, unless you're me and you like to draw them super wide, and still, remember to form a triangle between the bulb of the nose and the center of the eyes. Something equilateral will be fairly responsible, but you're free to find a ratio that works for you. If you ever find yourself struggling, just draw more skulls. Never enough skulls. When in doubt, skull it out. The last drawing tip we'll go over is the common mistakes. These are all mistakes I see far too often, such as making the eyeballs way too big. Keep those peepers in their sockets. If you can redline the eyeball and it takes up half of the skull, then you've drawn your eyes too big. The next mistake is drawing with no lighting in mind. This one is a freebie and applies to everything, but I feel like I see it done in eyes far too often. Always decide what lines you need to show and which ones you don't. Finally, the worst offender of all, drawing a side view of the face and making the eyes open up toward the side. 
try to remember, eyes are on the front of your face and they face forward. You should be seeing barely any of the eye itself when viewed from the side, usually just a triangular opening keeping in line with the face. I don't even know what someone would look like if their eyes opened up toward the side of their face, but it would be a little weird. Anyway, that's it for all of my fancy drawing and structure tips, but of course we're just getting started with the good stuff. It's time to do some painting. These are all going to be done completely from imagination, so I'll be trying my best to get them to look nice and realistic anyway. I'm once again aiming to get some variety of different looking eyes for all of these. Hopefully you can identify some of the various aspects I'm focusing on from what you've learned in this video so far. Alright, these six eyes should be fine, and I'm ready to move on to color. The first step is of course to colorize the lines. You can do this by simply setting a layer to lighten and filling it in with a saturated red tone. If you don't know by now, this is done to keep the colors from getting muddy once the line art starts mixing with the more painterly techniques. Next, I flattened the line art and created a multiply layer for my base colors. I'm going to keep with that cool greenish bluish background once again. It helps to let the warm tones of the skin really jump out. I wanted to get a nice variety of skin tones for each of the eyes, and it's great if you can keep this stage extra playful. The color zones of the face usually leave the eyes in the more reddish family, but the eyes also tend to have some purplish and bluish tones around them as well. It can easily become one of the most colorful areas of the face. I tried to bring in as many strong reds and purples as I could, along with some more cyan colors in the highlights. I could probably do a whole video on why cyan is the most popular color in the art world right now. Anyway, once the base colors are fun and lively enough, it's time to once again sink everything back to one layer and start just painting away on that single layer. If you're new to these videos, I am using Corel Painter for this process and mainly using a mixture of the acrylic dry brush for most of the painting and blending, the thick and thin pen for drawing lines and details, and a soft round airbrush for smoothing and subtle shifts of color and value. Zooming in on the top left eye, I think I spent the most time rendering this one. And if you're wondering, I spent between 30 minutes to an hour on each of these eyes, so enjoy the high speed time lapsing. A lot of the surrounding areas and folds around the eye are somewhat straightforward if you've watched a lot of my painting videos. Every stroke I make, I aim to have one hard edge side and the rest is soft and blended. The point of a fold, or just a plane shift, is where you place that hard edge, and then you just blend away from that point. It's important on skin tones to saturate the darkest spots. Never work toward a black tone. I personally like adding wrinkles and extra folds in the skin because it gives me something fun to do, but you can keep things pretty soft edge all around if you want to go for a younger and more flawless skin. All right, let's talk about the important stuff. The eyeball needs to stay in a value that doesn't stray too far from the surrounding skin tones. Never use white for the eyeball. Try to keep it in a color that's simply a slightly more desaturated version of whatever tone you picked up from the skin highlight areas. And that should almost never be white. The eyeball is of course round, so make sure you go out of your way to show the eyeball getting darker around the edges like you would any sphere being lit from the front. I like to use some yellowish and pinkish tones in the shadows of the eyeball. The lacrimal area should be a pink tone that blends nicely into the shadow area of the eye. You can always punch up the contrast and ambient occlusion once the larger color areas are established. The upper eyelashes facing us may not be overly visible, but the shadow they cast on the eyeball certainly is. Even in casual lighting, they help push the ambient occlusion at the top of the eyeball into a deeper value. We can finally talk about the iris. This is, of course, the most colorful and exciting part of the eye. Generally, I think it's fun to use a lot of different colors. I find that the inside part of the iris tends to be the brightest and usually warmest, so if you're going for green eyes, then you might have a yellow on the inside, and for blue eyes, maybe a hint of browns and oranges. I find it's great to start the iris painting with a punch of bright orange around the pupil. A lot of the other colors and patterns should feel like they're radiating out from that center. Think of it like a bike wheel. Lots of spokes of colors coming from the center. Another good tip, try not to make it the same all the way around. Make some areas slightly warmer, other areas slightly colder. Leave it a bit nebulous. You know, like a nebula. Just try to anchor that chaos with a bit of those radiating lines from the center that I mentioned. 
You can take things as far as you want. Just keep layering strokes on top of each other. You can also try adding little dots of color here and there. Personally, I just looked in my own eye in the mirror to get inspiration for how these patterns work. You might have to borrow a friend with colorful eyes to do your research. Anyway, remember how we made the inside of the iris the brightest part? Well, try using a bit of a darker edge around the entire outside of the iris to finish it off. I think that's most of the useful information about the iris. Back to the whole eyeball, you can even try to render out the individual cast shadows of the eyelashes if you're so inclined. But if we really want to send this eye to the next level, we need to implement some serious reflectivity. Not only is your eye extremely smooth, but it's also slightly wet, which makes it the most reflective material on your body. This is where the real exciting part happens. So you can start by adding a little hint of blue or whatever ambient light across the front of the eyeball, but we're going to take it much further by reflecting aspects of the environment off the eye, especially the light source. For this first eye, we're going to be indoors with a bright four-paned window creating our main light source. I love this stage of things. We're not quite done yet with our reflections though. That lacrimal area and the edge along the bottom of the eye all have enough moisture to create various speculars. We don't need to use pure white for these, just a much brighter pinkish tone will work fine at this scale. I think that's almost everything. If you're observant, you might notice that I always try to incorporate a little extra punch of brightness any place where two planes come together. This could be for the sake of bounced light, but it also just makes the plane changes feel confident and appealing. I'm quite happy with that eye. The iris especially came out better than I had hoped. Let's hop into the next one and I'll pick up the pace even more. I was going for a more Asian style eye this time around. We talked about that epicanthic fold and the overall simplification of things, so I'll be using a lot more airbrushing on this one and a lot less of my carving into forms. As cliche as it may sound, there are more yellow tones being used in this skin overall. It's not extreme, but the orange skin tones are leaning more toward the yellow side and less toward the red side for the base color. Now, a lot of Asian eyes tend to have much darker irises, which make them nearly blend right into the pupil. You might be thinking that this would make them far less interesting to paint, but oh no, we have a whole new goal to accomplish. Remember how I mentioned that the eye should reflect the environment? Well, with this almost mirror-like black iris, we can actually reflect the environment in much greater detail. First, we need to establish a setting. Well, when I was in Asia this year, people spent a lot of time on buses and subways staring at their phone. Let's see if we can make that setting and convey all of that information with just a reflection. The key is to be extremely subtle with most of it. The bright reflections from the subway windows should be the only thing creating any major contrast. The hand in the cell phone itself should be super dark in value. Just slight reflections in the eye that you might not even notice if I hadn't told you about them, along with the ground and some other loose details. The subway windows probably could have been in slightly better perspective, but I'm still happy with this overall. Anyway, the same details still apply as with the last eye, some speculars around the lacrimal area and bottom of the eye. Although remember, the lacrimal area is slightly obscured by that epicanthic fold, so it's a bit darker in there. The eyelashes are once again all lightly drawn in. I'm doing my best to not draw too much attention to them. There's a very thin line between defining them and leaving them unnoticeable. I find it to be the trickiest part about painting eyes to be honest. In the end, I couldn't quite stand that overly airbrushed look, so I tried to at least add some minor lines and skin spots here and there. A little hint of the eyebrows didn't hurt either. Let's move right along. The bottom eye shares a lot of similarities with the first eye, but I'm going to really focus on having a dark bag under the lower eyelid, a feature I can personally relate to all too well. I'm just happy it lets me play with some of those deep reddish and slightly purplish tones. My other goal for this eye is to heighten the colors even more, so you might notice a little punch of extra bright saturation between the major plane changes. For the iris itself, I got a bit carried away. I wanted to get a much bolder blue eye and see how far I could push those previous ideas of bringing the warm orange tone around the pupil. The pattern is a little bit silly. It starts to just look like a synthetic android eyeball or something. 
Of course, once I realized that, I just had to push it further and make this eye set in some kind of science lab environment. Or maybe it looks more like a dentist chair with that bright segmented ring light reflecting against the middle of the iris. I think I forgot to mention it previously, but there's an important area of skin that comes right up against the lacrimal area on the inside of your eye. If you feel it with your fingers, you might notice how smooth and oily this area of skin is. Because of this, it's a great spot to include some of the brightest highlights of any area of the face. You can see that all of these eyes will have that bright reflective area off of the inside of the lower eyelid. It's a fun part to highlight, so look for it in lots of artists' work. You can even bring in some cyans there if you're feeling adventurous. Anyway, once I zoomed out on this eye, I realized that my crazy blue was not meshing well with the other more realistic eyes on the page. So I decided to keep my android aesthetic, but dial it back into a more grayish tone. I think it works better as a whole image now. Maybe I should have added a serial number or something in there as well. Hmm. Huh. Okay, this video is going on super long and probably no one will watch it once they see the length, so let's pick up the pace again. Remember my video on drawing darker skin tones? Probably not. Well, a quick recap. Darker skins usually have a much more deeper reddish hue and earthy tone. The key to good darker skin tones is that you should focus more on the reflected environmental highlights rather than the shadows on the skin. If your character is outside, bring in lots of blues and focus on highlight shapes instead of shadow shapes. The darker the skin, the more you should focus on highlights rather than shadows. So I didn't really do anything too wild with the iris this time, but I did try to get some nice hue variations on the skin itself. Also, take note of how dark the eyeball itself is, since this eye is slightly squinting a bit more than the rest and letting in less light. Next up, the eye in the bottom right was coming from a slightly 3 fourths perspective, so that had a small effect on the shapes. But for this one, I really just wanted to get intense with the hard edges and stroke economy. Actually, hold up. I'm sure at least one of you is probably thinking, what was the point of that whole eye lump thing at the start of this video? You haven't used it at all. Well, one person, that's actually a good point. If you're direct drawing like I did with these eyes, there really isn't a point. However, if I'm drawing in pencil, or pretend digital pencil, then I definitely love using that method. It helps everything come together without any worries. Other than that, the actual best use of eye lumps is when you're freely painting. You can blob some skin tones around on the canvas and block in your eyes in the most effective way with some quick eye lumps. You don't even have to worry about drawing in the details until later in the process. So here's a quick 10 minute example painting of some goofy looking character nonsense. Okay, well that looks awful, so let's get back to our eye collection. And it seems like we've gone too far off the deep end again with these eye colors. Sometimes restraint is the hardest quality to master as an artist. Okay, let's just blend that all out and keep things somewhat realistic. More desaturated tans and greens. I should probably have just left it here, but it looks like I kept going again. I really do need to work on this whole restraint thing. Oh well. Let's throw this eye in some new environment and have a nice sun reflection bouncing off the middle. As I zoom out, I think I went a bit too bright on the eyeball itself, so a bit of airbrushing can push that back into a more realistic tone. Finally, on to the last eye. Let's close things out with an eye we're all familiar with, the eye of someone who's been watching a YouTube video for far too long at some horrible midnight hour and is coming to grips with their poor life decisions. This one will be a lot of fun because I get to light things from below. What a nice change of pace. All of those downward facing planes getting lit by the stale blue light of a computer screen, while the upward facing planes can get a nice deep red shadow. Even our point of view is looking up at this eye, so we can finally see a hint of the inside of the upper eyelid catching a bunch of light. I really love these blue highlights, so I'm trying to make them glow as much as I can without being too silly. The eyeball itself can be super pushed into the dark tones for now, and we'll actually be able to see all of the upper eyelashes from this vantage point. Amazing, I know. The only thing I couldn't decide is if those eyelashes should be catching light themselves or be shown with darker tones. I tried to just have a little bit of both. The finishing touch is of course the computer screen reflected into the bottom of the eyeball. As the only main light source, it can be pretty bright. I can hint at some other monitors in the room as well, but since they're not directly lighting our eye, they can be somewhat unimportant. 
some speculars around the inside of the upper lid this time will seal the deal. Behold, the glory and terror contained within this eye, and most of your eyes by this point. Let's wrap this up fast. I had a lot of fun making this video and painting these eyes for all of you. I truly hope you enjoyed the spectacle of it all. Please share it with other artists if the chance arises. I know this was a long video for something that has quick tips in the title, but thank you all so much for watching. And as always, the biggest of thank yous to all of my lovely patrons for making this all possible. Maybe I'll post up one of these eye paintings in real time for all of you wonderful patrons. Alright, my voice is dead. See you everyone.